It's a great pleasure to welcome Christo to Dartmouth. This lecture and his presence on campus are sponsored by the Montgomery Endowment, which was founded in 1977 through a very generous gift on the part of Kenneth Montgomery, class of 1925, his wife, Harl Montgomery. And since 1977, we've had a great many distinguished uh, speakers, but I don't know if we've had as many attendants or spectators for any one of these um, individuals. I haven't been the director long enough to uh, have the historical knowledge. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Christo. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry that Jean-Claude is not here with us, but I try to be substitute her and try to remember what she was saying when she started the lecture. Anyway, I will show you here for, uh, for 45 minutes, 80 cover slides about the future project we're working, who started many, many years ago. Uh, I will not uh, um, articulate too much of these cover slides, basically to create interest and you can answer, uh, ask questions after that. Uh, I will answer any question, but will not answer questions about other artists. We do not answer questions about religion and politics. <laughs> and we do not, uh, we do not, I also talk we because we were always together with Jean-Claude before. We do not answer questions about uh, generality. Now, uh, myself and Jean-Claude was born on the same day, 19, June 30, 1935. And we met uh, with Jean-Claude almost 51 years ago. And she passed away a few months ago. Now, I will go to sit down here. And we start to show the color slides in total darkness. I will not read anything and try to be fast. That way I can answer many questions. Thank you. Now put the lights down. <laughs> the lights, all the lights. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. OK, start. In 1991, uh, we were finishing the project The Umbrellas joint project for Japan and the United States. There was 1,340 blue umbrellas in Japan and 1,760 yellow umbrellas in Southern California. Each umbrella was 20 feet tall, 29 feet diameter, and the length of the project in Japan was 12 miles long and about two and a half miles wide. In Japan, we have a Sato River, a 90 umbrella standing in the Sato River, and the length of the project in California was uh, 19 miles long and about two and a half miles wide. Actually, the California side was in half was in Los Angeles County, about 60 miles uh, from Lax International Airport to Los Angeles and Kern County. Now, when this umbrella was standing uh, uh, in late 91, we received a letter from the president of the German, from the president of the German Parliament, Professor. Professor Dr. Richard Sussman. Now, many years before we start to have an idea about the umbrellas, in 1971, we start to work on a project involving the wrapping of the former parliament, that time, 1971, of Germany in the Reichstag, and today, of course, the parliament of Germany in Berlin. And that project takes a long period of negotiation. We have three refusals in 1977, 1981, and 1987. And when the umbrellas were standing in Japan and California, the president of the German parliament, Professor Dr. Rita Sussman, congratulating us for the umbrellas and saying now that it's probably a chance to start to work again on the permits for the Reichstag. But we have idea already for the new project. And I will show here the very early study about over the river. Now, this is very little drawings, so 8 and a half by 11 inches, done in 2002, 2003. And it's the proposal to suspend fabric panel horizontally. You can experience the project from above, walking on the banks of the river. I glue a little, little person here. And we'll go down under, uh, near the water, can experience the project from underneath. Now, these two little drawings, they are now in the collection of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Actually, the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. is the biggest collector of our work of original work. They have about 60 original works in the National Gallery. But the chances to get permits for the rice tech was so greater, and between 92 and 94, we spent 160 days in the capital of Germany, that time city of Bonn, 
negotiating with the 660 deputies of the German parliament the uh, proposal to get permission for the wrapping of the rice tank. Only during the summertime, when the parliamentarians was on holiday, we have time for over the river. We were very eager to do the over the river in the United States. You know that most of the great river in the United States, they're born in the Rocky Mountains. And the Rocky Mountains divide the water, sometimes to the west to the, of the river, to the west of the Pacific Ocean, sometimes to the east, to the Mississippi River. And in 92, and 93, and 94, uh, we spent 15,000 miles inspecting 89 rivers in the Rocky Mountains. And from these 89 rivers, we find six possible sites for our project. Now, there was two rivers in the state of Idaho. Pyatt River, this section of Pyatt River, northeast of Boise, Idaho, the section of Salmon River near Idaho, Montana border, section of Wind River here in Wyoming, two parts of the river in the eastern slope. Of, this is the uh, eastern slope the, in Colorado, Cache La Poudre, north of Denver, Arkansas River, south from Denver, and section of Rio Grande of New Mexico. Uh, <coughs> We're traveling with our engineers and uh, uh, friends, collaborators, and our friend photographer, Wolfgang Waltz, who always take pictures. And I will show you here now with the real situation when I'm uh, Israel site of project. And actually, I'm standing here to give you the scale of that. And that is the much more recent study. But in 1993 and uh, 1994, in February, we received finally permission for the wrapping of the rice stack. And we put all our energy, resources, of money. And finally, in 1995, in June, the rice tank was wrapped with 1 million square feet of that silver cover fabric and 10 miles of rope. And for two weeks, over 5 million people come around the rice tank and see the project. <laughs> After two weeks of exhibition of the rice tank, all the materials was removed, industrially recycled. There was a fabric, and cables, and steel, and the ropes. All back, all back to the industry and returned back to New York City. Now, many years before uh, we, before, um, we have realized the rice tech, in 1979, we have a project for, for New York City called the Gates. And we started negotiating the permission for the government of uh, uh, New York, at that time the Koch administration, and we never get permission. In 1981, we have a refusal. And in 1995, <coughs> We start again to try to revive the permitting process for the gates, but the Giuliani administration was not at all interested about our proposal. And we don't have a, any results on, on the story of the gates. This is why we, right away after the rice tech and the summer of 96, we returned to the Rocky Mountains. Now, you see here our chief engineer, Vince Davenport. This is Jean-Claude Standing, myself, and our friends, collaborators. We try to take a lot of measurements about these rivers. We pinpoint possible site of our project. Davenport, Vince Davenport designed that special yellow rope to simulate our steel cables and to give us enough clearance between the water and the cables because our fabric should be clear enough that the rafters can go under the water. For example, you can see here three yellow rope, three yellow rope creating the space for two fabric panels. And we go through all the six possible sites for our project. And we take a lot of uh, data, information. And by the late 96, early 97, we come to consensus for aesthetical engineering purposes that the, the most uh, accurate site for our project, the most ideal site for our project would be that section of Arkansas River and the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains. Now, this is the uh, Denver the uh, capital of the, uh, Colorado. This is the Colorado Springs, the second largest city. And the project involved uh, 60, 40 miles of Arkansas River, when we're installing around six miles of fabric panels in many, many locations. Now, there are two entrances in the project in the valley of uh, the corridor of Arkansas River. You have one entrance coming here from the east, from Colorado Springs, Denver, in Canyon City, and another entrance from Aspen and uh, 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 Vail and Buena Vista, and, and of course, east entrance and west entrance in the project. Having the site, our friend photographer started to take photographs, and this is how Arkansas River looked during the summertime. Now, at the south bank of the river, you have the Highway 50 running east-west. 
the north bank of the river have the Union Pacific Railroad tracks. One of the reasons we choose Arkansas River is because it's the most rafted river in the United States. A very gentle rafting, family rafting with category two, a basic, a few occasions, category three. And because it's so rafted, there are many parking, many uh, uh, walking uh, facility going down to the river. And of course, it's very used. There are 300,000 rafters in the summertime for the, for the project. Having the site of the project, I started to do study and collage it with the real situation. Now, the, this is original work, much small, that color slice is 13 and a half by 26 inches. The left side is the work in two parts. The right side is the area of the map. I use finer fabric to simulate our fabric panels. Typical interruption when you have a, a tree and a rock formation. And of course, this is how put twine to simulate the cable of the fabric. Now, when you go down to the water, you have totally different vision of the project. Now, the fabric panels, they're only above the water, meaning that the width of the fabric panels varied with the width of the water. Sometimes they width only 45 feet, sometimes they are 120 feet wide. The steel cables go much further away anchor of the banks of the river. The distance from the water to the fabric is minimum eight feet, but on some occasion is 10 and 50 feet, 15 feet, because the banks of the river is higher. And also the banks of the river, they are not always horizontal, not the same height, meaning that sometimes the fabric panel, they are inclined because one bank of the river that is higher. The fabric, the, cl uh, the cloth, the material we use for our project is especially woven, loosely woven fabric that through the fabric, you can see all the cloud formation and contour of the mountains. Like with all our project, the most difficult part is to get the permission. Everything in the world is owned by somebody. There are not one square meters in the world does not belong to somebody. And before we start to work in the permitting process, we try to find who owns that area, and we found that and almost 98% of this five, uh, 40 miles of Arkansas River is in the, the uh, is belong to United States citizen, basically, and the Department of Interior of the federal government in Washington. They have a special uh, um, under office called Bureau of Land Management, who take care about the land owned by the United States citizen. Actually, probably you don't know that taxpayer of the United States own 20% of the land of the United States. And the BLM leases the land, leases the land to ranchers, to oil company, to our state, to county, to different agency. And of course, we need to get the permission for the federal government of Washington for our project from the state of Colorado, two counties of Colorado, Fremont and Chaffee County, and 11 governmental agencies, state and county agency. But in this corridor of 40 miles, the town and villages and factory and school and all activity happened. And before we go to Washington, this is all happened in the late 90s, I hope in this time. We, we presenting the project to the community. You can see here, for example, we are in the senior citizen center in Salida, the town near the western entrance of the project. Uh, and we are putting in the wall some of our previous project. And now Salida is mostly populated with senior citizen hippies. <laughs> senior citizen hippies. And we try to explain to them uh, what we are. And we're telling, for example, that now in 1969, in the Australia, outside of Sydney, Australia, we wrap coastline using one and, a half, uh, one and a half miles of coastline near Little Bay, near Sydney, Australia, using uh, 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 over one and a half million square feet of fabric and 30 miles of ropes. That was done in 1969. In 1972, we did the project in the western slope of the Rocky Mountains, the Valley Curtain. We hung it orange curtain in the Rocky Mountains. The span is the site of the principal span of the Brooklyn Bridge. The center height of the Valley Curtain was 180 feet, and the main foundation is 360 feet. Between 1972 and 76, we worked hard to get permission. And finally, in 1976, the running fence was realized. The running fence was 20 feet tall, uh, uh, 18 feet tall, and 24 and a half miles long, long running to Sonoma and Marin County, and the western extremity of the fence disappearing in the Pacific Ocean for the quarter of a mile. Now, in 1978, we did that project at Loose Park in Kansas City, Missouri. 
when we covered two and a half miles walkway with this golden fabric in late September, early October, with foliage of the trees start to match the color of the fabric. And in 1983, we realized the surrounded island. That project is Jean Claude's idea. We surrounded 11 islands with six and a half million square feet of floating pink fabric. The fabric was attached and the uh, beach area of the islands floating 220 feet on the surface of the water and anchoring with 670 marine anchors to the shallow Biscayne Bay. And in 1985, after 10 years working, we wrapped the oldest bridge in Paris, the Pont Neuf, is in the middle of Paris, is the uh, built bridge 400, over 400 years ago. And from Salida, where is it? Uh, bigger town in the western end of, of the project, we go to Canyon City with another town in the eastern end of the project. Our team here, Vince Davenport, Mr. Miller, myself, Jean-Claude, and all the officials for federal government, uh, Department of Interior, and the, high, and the highway department, and we answer questions. This is all in the late 90s. From uh, Colorado, now we're going to the Washington during the Clinton administration, and we have a big support during the Clinton administration. The Secretary of Interior, this is the director of BLM, Mr. Fry, but the Secretary of Interior was the Bruce Babbitt, the former, no, turn, no, turn, back, 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 no, okay. But uh, uh, Bruce Babbitt was the uh, big supporter of the project. He allowed us to move ahead very much. But it was very important to convince, work with the federal government, and with all the other agency who was involved with the permitting process that we can move ahead simultaneously. It's called the memorandum of understanding that when we're discussing our issue, that all the representative of different agency, if they also represented, that we do not go one after one explaining our project. And here, typical meeting, you know, our team is in the left side here, and all the agency, they're on the right side here. And the way that we're discussing the issue they have simultaneously, everybody trying to answer the same question right away. Part of that proposal involving also to articulate how the project will be built. We we'll never do the same things again, meaning that we will never surround another islands, we will never build another running fence, or another valley curtain. Basically, we do not know ourselves how that project is, will be done. And our chief engineers and many other engineers involved with the project need to find a way to make solution to build that project. We hire the services of the engineering company, uh, we internal services of engineering company in Canada, outside of Toronto and Guelph, when we have this uh, uh, wind tunnel test. Actually, we're in behind the glass. Here, our team is behind the glass. And this is the three panels, so one sixteenth scale. And our engineers in Toronto try to study all the force of the wind in the fabric and the anchors and the cables and the hooks, how much fabric should be, uh, how much extra fabric should be sewn. All that things was preparing in the, in the uh, pre, uh, in part of the permitting process. I will tell you also that the, because we do not know how the project will look, we need to find it, the uh, materials uh, uh, who, who the project will be built. Basically for each of our projects, we're doing always life site tests, meaning that in some place far away from the site of our project, secretly, we can make a rehearsal and one-to-one -one scale, very small section of the project uh, to learn it, what we should not do, what we should do, how to improve, many, many things. In the late 90s, between 1997 and 1998 and 1999, we did four life site tests in private ranch, 300 miles away from Arkansas River, when we built one-to-one one-to-one -one scale life size panels. You see our compound is here. We have here the fabric panels, and our engineers can study the effect of the wind, the cables, how the fabric move with the wind. We, for example, how much more extra fabric we need to sew in the fabric panels. We have a more silver, silver and copper. This is how the fabric will be attached with the hooks. Uh, here underneath, you see how from underneath you can see the cloud formation. Usually I don't like to show this color slides, but this is part of the, of the way how this project is here actually. To give you the scale, here is the Jean-Claude standing, and this is the one of these life size uh, um, tests done in the late 90s. Also, I was saying that we have this 
5.9 miles of, yeah, 6 miles of fabric panels spread on 40 miles of river. With our engineers also we walk and finally pinpoint the places of these fabric panels. There were near 1,000 fabric panels positioned. For example, you see that all the fabric panels, they are rectangular. The red line is the steel cables, but of course the stable cables go much further away. And when the fabric, when the river turns, we need to fabricate especially these trapezoid fabric panels. On some occasion, we have even 90 degree, this is the curve of the river. We have a 90 degree curve and need to intricately fabricate it, position the anchors place, because this is all part of the permitting process we need to be explained to the federal government how the project will be built. All that costs a lot of money. Myself and Jean-Claude were not independently wealthy. The money comes from the sale of preparatory works, original works of art I do at my studio alone. All the original works, they're done my, by myself. I do not have a system. Now, I will show you the part of my studio where I do the small works of art. You know, for over 40 years, I have no time to clean my studio. <laughs> I'm here on the tables, and I am drawing small pieces. They call collages because in French meaning that I glue things, often uh, uh, reandering there with graphite, pencil, and paper, and other technical information, photography. And when the collage is finishing, looking like that. This is the work in two parts about the pond nerve. The left side is 13 and a half by 26 inches. The right side is 13 and a half by 12 inches. The left side is one with charcoal, pencil, graph, uh, a pastel, wax crayon. I use finer fabric to simulate the fabric of the pond nerve, the twine to simulate the ropes. And the, of course, the other part is the aerial photography of the pond nerve in the center of Paris, actually this island of the city with the Notre Dame and the rea uh, reproduction of renderings of architect de Marchand de Cerceau who designed the Pont Neuf in the 16th century. Now, that particular preparatory work done much before the Pont Neuf was realized is in private collection in Belgium. Another work at the same site is about the gates, you know. Again, that is the, the, the fabric of the fabric panel of the gates is much finer fabric. I cut the board of the paper. I create a false here. I draw with pastel, charcoal, wax crayon, and a pencil, and actually that study which is done in 2003, close to the realization of the project, already we have the real fabric sample of the real fabric we use for the panels of the, the Gates project. And this is the section that particular drawing is situated. Very much like architect, I do also using photography. It's not working. The next color slides, please. We have problem with the color. Yeah. Okay. This is a very small uh, piece, 18 and a half by 11 inches, photographed by Wolgan Voss. And of course, I draw with uh, uh, ena uh, enamel paint and wax crayon. And these little sketches, I use them for the larger drawings. The larger drawings, I put the paper on wooden board. And this is another part of my studio where in the wooden board, this many years ago, I would draw, I'm making drawings about the Reistek project, this little sketch here about the Reistek project, and when that drawing is finishing looking like that, is a, again a two parts, a lower part is 42 by 65 inches, upper 15 by 65 inches, lower part is the, showing the south facade of the Reistek with Brandenburg gates, pastel charcoal and wax crayon, upper part you have a cross section of the Reistek building, and the aerial photography of Wolgan Voss from 1970 with the Brandenburg gate and the Reistek. That drawings is in a private collection in, in Germany. The next is the drawings about the same site about the, uh, the, the over the river. You see, when the, uh, uh, the uh, Highway 50 here is higher banks than the railroad track of Union Pacific and the fabric panel they are inclined. The larger drawings is 96 inches drawings. This is a preparatory study for the blue umbrellas in Japan. This is the entire valley of Ibaraki. They are actually here, 1,340 blue dots. In that small village of Jimba, who have about 35 houses, we install over 100 umbrellas. That drawing is in the private collection in Switzerland. Now, from the fifth floor, which is my studio, we're living in an industrial building in downtown Manhattan. I bring this original works to our second floor, which is actually our place where we're receiving the potential buyers of original works of art. Now, the potential buyers of original works of art, they're collectors, buying works of art to hang their homes. There are museums, 
their dealers and private dealers and corporate collectors, they come, they choose the work, they give us money, and they take the work. This, we have, this is the way we have money. I hope you understand, there's no other mystery. Sometimes the collectors of museum like to have early pieces. I can show you here, for example, this is the package belong to, this is wall piece, much smaller piece of uh, sculpture done on fabric and, and rope from 1961, belong to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And this is another piece done from 1964. Now, between 1964 and 67, I did sculpture, actually recuperated from demolition of the street of storefronts. I built these storefronts inside in the room and they're life sites and, and they have glass, but you cannot see anything because the of a curtain stopping the visibility in, inside in the storefront. You have a door, you cannot open the door. This uh, works, they're like a precursor of other curtain arrangements. That particular storefront from 1964 is in the Smithsonian Institution, the Hirschen Collection in Washington, D.C. Having this money allows us to pay, for example, we spent $26 million to build umbrellas in 1991. 1991 and $21 million to finish the gates. But many years before, we have idea about the, uh, over the river. In 1966, we tried to wrap trees during the winter time in Forest Park, San Luis, Missouri. We never get permission. In 1967, 1968, we tried to wrap the trees of Avenue of Champs Elysees in Paris. We never get permission. And finally, in 1997, we started negotiating and we get the permission and we wrap the 178th Street and Berover Park and Fundacion Bayler outside of Basel, Switzerland. We have a sunny days of this 178th wrap Street. We have a winter day, this is cover pictures, and we have a beautiful sunset. Now, many years before that project was realized, in the late 50s, I did a number of works involving oil barrels. These humble industrial barrels with different colors. Some of the barrels was wrapped, some was not wrapped. And in 1992, just here after Berlin Wall was built in Berlin, I did, we did with Jean-Claude and myself, we did our 1962. 1962. Uh, just after, one year after Berlin Wall was built in 1962, Jean-Claude and myself, we did it. Our second uh, uh, together work was the iron work called the Iron Curtain, the wall of 240 barrels in the small street in Rivis County in Paris. That was poetical response of Berlin Wall, built a year ago in 1961 in Berlin. Now, through the years, we did a lot of temporary installation with the, with the old barrels. We tried to build others in the museum, mostly in the museum. In the late 60s, we tried to do large work in Texas, but we never go anywhere. And finally, in 1997, 1977, we started to work on the project involving Abu Dhabi. In 1990, 1997, we arrived in Abu Dhabi, proposing to build the Mastaba of Abu Dhabi. Now, I, I hope you can see very well. Uh, 19, 1977, 1970, 1979, 1979, we're in Abu Dhabi now here. I, I hope in this, you see a little bit, see. When you start horizontal barrels, you see this little circle here, it created horizontally, it created a structure called mastaba. It's not a pyramid. It have a two perpendicular wall, two slanted wall, and truncate top. The angle of the, uh, of the barrels created in 60 degree. This is over 60 degree angle. And we propose to build mastaba of 410,000 oil barrels. This is the photomontage, not yet realized. The vertical wall, this is the vertical wall, is 500 feet tall, 1,000 feet underground, and the slanted wall is 750 feet underground. When approaching, approaching the vertical wall, it's like an Islamic mosaic, you see, have a multicolor, thousand multicolor barrels here. This is a little cast, giving the scope of the project. In 1979, Jean-Claude and myself, we arrived in Abu Dhabi, much younger, you will see here, talking to the representative of Sheikh Zayed Al-Nahayan. This is the founder of United Arab Emirates. 
proposing that project, a start of negotiating the permit and the site for the project. You can see here, uh, we're an airline in the town when the family of Zaid is born, and we're working with a representative. It tried to, this is all happened between 1979 and 1982. Uh, the next. In 1977, I've tried to talk, 2007, we again started working. For almost 20 years, we were not involved in the, that area because Jean Claude was worried that they started the war between Iran and Iraq in the mid 80s. And after that, the situation became very grave. And myself and Jean Claude never really physically go to Abu Dhabi, only working from here. But in 19, uh, 2007, we hired services of several engineering professors of schools of Switzerland, United Kingdom, United States, and the University of Tokyo of Japan to work of structural feasibility of the, the barrels project, the master barrel. This is working with a professor of the um, engineering school of Zurich, actually how the project should be built physically and how time would take that project to be realized. And 1999, in Museum of Germany, we built the work called the wall of 13,000 oil barrels. This is inside an atrium in Museum of, near Dusseldorf and Oberhausen when we installed this wall of 13,000 oil barrels to give you the scope how these barrels will look in that inside room in the museum in Germany. Many years before that, pro that wall was realized in Germany, I was saying that we start to work on the Gates project, but finally in 2001, a friend of ours was elected mayor of New York City. When Mr. Michael R. Bloomberg was elected mayor of New York City, we were sure that finally we get permission for the is installation of the gates. We stopped to work on Over the River, another project. We put all our resources to get the permission from the city of New York, and we spent the next few years to realize the gates project. And we installed these 7,503 gates over 24 and a half, 23 and a half miles walkway in Central Park. We have a 25 different width of gates. The gate was always 16 feet tall, and we have a sunny days, and we have a winter days, and here we have the gates from above in Central Park. Now, this has happened in 2005 in February, just five years ago. All the materials of the gates was removed, industrially recycled, and the summer of 2005 were returned back to the site of Colorado. Now, our chief engineer, Vince Davenport, need to hire a, a Colorado certified engineers to sign all our paper. And yet now we're working with the Colorado certified engineers to the, for the working permit. After that, we hear recounting that the federal government of Washington have a director of the Bureau of Land Management Colorado. We are now a director of Bureau of Land Management Colorado representing federal government of Washington. Here, with the mayor of Denver, who is a big supporter of um, again, Hicken Looper, who was very important to move the project to the uh, bureaucratic uh, situation in the, the Colorado. One important part was the North Bank of the River. North Bank of the River, the Union Pacific Railroad Com Company leased the North Bank of the River from the federal government since the time of Abraham Lincoln, meaning that without Union Pacific to get the permission, we will never do that project. And we spend a lot of extensive time, but actually this is the only permits we have physically because we created very close, close uh, collaboration and friendly relation, and we are in Omaha here talking with the president, with the vice president of Union Pacific, and all his collaborators to finalize all our activity and using the railroad tracks to move a lot of hardware and materials for our project and relieve the traffic and the highway. Here we are talking to the state park director of Colorado. Here we're talking to the commissioners of the Fremont County. There are two counties, there are Fremont County and Chaffee County. Here, typical meeting. We, count, we did a countless meeting like tonight here. After the lecture with color slides, Jean-Claude here, myself, our project director, Junita Davenport, our chief engineer is here, and we are going on the stage and answering all kinds of questions from traffic to wildlife to the economics to the security, many, many things. And, and the project moving in the permitting process. This is the, now federal government have a representative exactly at the site of our project. And here, 
near the uh, Arkans area, we're talking to them here. We need to explain to the federal government how we build the project. I don't like to bother with, with the technical things, but you know, one most important part for that project is that to have a absolutely parallel cables, because our fabric is hooked in the cables and is open by sliding the hooks and the cable. And we need to have a cable who is completely parallel. Our chief engineer, Vince Davenport, designed a special structure who actually is just above the ground. Sometimes it's only about one and a half feet, sometimes it's two feet, or even less, that allow us to slice that part, who is actually these little things here, when the cable is attached, that we correct, can correct the, that the, each cable is parallel and themselves. But the federal government like to also witness what kind of machinery will we use for the project. Uh, we need to demonstrate the type of anchor we will use, very uh, different type, this is a small type of anchor. Here is another much heavy anchor, and actually we can collect all the dust, that no dust, no any uh, things which happen to the site. We hire the services of the other company, we pay that company, to prepare our application. You know, the application to the federal government is very complex things. That company work, Denver company, we're specialists of engineers, traffic engineers, garbage engineers, economist engineers. They work over one year. They cost one and a half million dollars, and they produce this book of 2029 page book, who is called the Planning and Design Report, how the project will be built. That book is was submitted to the federal government. That is our application. Now, the federal government hire another company who, co who cost two and a half million dollars, another company, to study all the findings in that book and prepare an environmental impact statement. And which happened just right now. And now to finish that boring lecture, I will show you here typical view of <laughs> Of the, over the river. Now, this is much more recent uh, study collage with all the, all the connect, all the position of the fabric panels here. You read in fabric sample already of the fabric panel. Typical situation, you see how when they, sometimes the fabric get very inclined. And the next other view from underneath, when you have the turn of the river, like that area here, and you see how we need to fabricate these very special panels. Thank you very much. Now, be, thank you. Before I start to answer questions, you understand, all our project, I, I don't like to bother in the lecture, all our project, the season project, meaning happen the particular season of the year. For example, Miami project in Florida was spring project before the hurricanes in Miami come. And we also, all, always ask two weeks, like 14 days exhibition time, and this 14 days exhibition time, we tried to exhibit the project. Miami project was the spring project, when the Gates project was the winter project because we like to have a leafless tree. Through the leafless trees, you can see the Gates. If you know, during the summertime, Central Park is like forest. But over the river is a summer project because we like to have our rafters. Only during the summertime, the rafters come there. And for over the river project, we ask permission for two weeks between July 15 and August 15, a summer can be the two last week of July, one week of July, first week of August, or two weeks early, two weeks of August. That two weeks, when that period of time came from the consensus between the people living there, the uh, school, when the school start, the, when the rafting season start to come down, they have extension of the rafting season. And of course, this is come, uh, but it sh should be in the summertime. Now, the Project is in the permitting process, the last stage of the permitting process. If we get permission by the summer of next year, for all our projects, we need at least two years lead time to realize the project because all these hardware materials, they do not exist in the stores. We need to fabricate these materials, meaning that we need to have this material fabricated and installed and, and put anchors, many things, meaning that the earliest time, if we get permission in 2011, the earliest time will be in the summer of 2013, who is just around the corner, very close. <laughs> okay. I have so many empty seats, probably should invite some of these people another room. 
who is not here, yeah, they should be. Uh, Let me just remind you about, if you have a question, just walk out to the aisle and line up by the microphone and ask your question. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. It obviously takes so a myriad of uh, way, angles, perspectives, looking at your projects to make them happen. Uh, my question is about the materials that you use. How do you decide the color for the fabrics, and can you explain a little bit more about why you chose um, oil barrels for your other pr for some of your projects? It's not it's a new project. The project started many year, many years ago. Of that, yeah. You know, the the, the starting with the fabric, the uh, <laughs> the color of the fa each project is uh, different. I, I don't like to say the same things about or that, but taking the example about the the um, umbrellas who have uh, two colors, blue and yellow. And, and the umbrellas project was a work of art in two parts. The classical work of art in two parts is the, <coughs> you saw the art historian, uh, uh, art history. Often the two canvases do one work, of, basically have, it's called diptych. Sometimes they three canvases, one work of art. And we try to do work of art which is not a painting, not a sculpture, but is like a, a diptych involving the space. And we were very eager to do work involving the two richest countries in the world, Japan and the United States, who have a great similarity, very great differences, to, to highlight similarity differences of the two richest countries in the world. And the many, many things are put aside. But finally, we choose the site of California and Japan, and the color came to that uh, uh, very important part. The project was slashed to be an autumn. And of course, during the summertime in Southern California, who is our side, just in Los Angeles Ken, Ken County, during the summertime, the sun burn the hills of California. They come blown and uh, uh, brown, burned by the sun. Very dry landscape, with that very dry landscape, which is yellow. When in Japan, during the summertime, is raining and pouring, and late September, early October, you have this lush foliage of the bamboo forest and deep green of evergreen and the very wet landscape, which is blue. Blue, wet, yellow, dry. And of course, there are many uh, tonality, hue of yellow, hue of blue, but I like with, with the Over the River project, we did life side states, you know. We have a different yellow, different blue, we wet them, we see how they look in the sun, and we choose the right yellow, the giant light blue. This is the for the um, umbrellas. The story for Miami is different, the story of the rice stick is different, the pond is different, but they, they, they're all their own story. For the barrels, no. The barrels, the involving with my work with barrels start from the late 50s, you know. When I start to wrap the first thing, there was a simple wrapped object and sometimes even wrapped cans, these cylindrical wrapped cans. These ordinary wrapped cans used in the oil paint and there was uh, some wrap, some not wrap. And from the cans come the barrels wrapped. Of course, the time, time the wrapped barrels were with the fabric, and the no, who was the entirely cover, but the color of the barrels was non wrapped barrels. And I started with this construction of barrels in the late 50, early 60. And from the wrapped barrels, we come to the open, not wrapped barrels industrially. We make the stand vertically, you can see in some reproduction, and finally, in 1968-69, we, uh, we used them horizontally for the Rivers County, but in 1968-69, we created the first project for the Mastaba. You see, it's funny. At that time, we tried to do a project between Houston and Galveston, much smaller size Mastaba. We never get permission. Later, in the early 70s, we tried to do it in Holland, Netherlands, outside of the Rijksmuseum Coral Müller on Otterlo. We never get permission. And finally, friends guide us to move to place who were just became independent. The United Arab Emirates was created in 1971 to the 72. Until 72 was British protectorate, and they became independent in 72, and a friend of us guided us to Abu Dhabi in 1977. Yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. My question is, can you talk a little bit about the creative philosophy which you and Jean-Claude developed, particularly the temporary nature of the installations? Do you want me to repeat that? Yeah, I understand. Our creating philosophy. 
your creative philosophy, what, um, particularly the fact that the installations are temporary, that they, they are typically in place for a couple of weeks at most. Yeah. Okay, the temporary character of our project. Jean-Claude have a much better answer, but I try to, <laughs> sim yeah, you know. Uh, uh, it's basi basically, there are many facets, but the temporary is also one thing. But this is not only, only one important thing. There are many other important things. But I can tell you that uh, the project have this, uh, how to say it, nomadic dimension, very fragile. And of course, uh, uh, Jean-Claude always compare uh, our project with uh, our life, you know. Uh, she always say that uh, art before was used with sturdy materials, but we like to donate it and have to our art something that will not last, like our life, like our childhood. And of course, that type of using very fragile material create urgency to be seen because tomorrow we will be gone. And of course, also it, it, it have that idea that will be once in a lifetime and never again. And all the project create that things that cannot be owned also. Cannot be bought, it cannot charge tickets, is there, irreplaceable, it cannot be repeat, like our existence, and, and create totally different energy. There is some kind of, when the project is there for 14 days, everybody is, is aware that they are already in presence of something missing, which was tomorrow will be gone right away. And that creates totally different perception. And they're, you know, their films, their my drawings, their photographs, their all kinds of things about the, the project, but they're not substitution of the project. Now that comes to the another thing is that I hope you understand this project, they're not about things. They're the things. And try to my poor English to explain you. When we wrap the rice stack, we do not do project about the rice stack. We wrap the rice stack. Many things like when you see film about the Vietnam War, you don't blurt in the movie theater. Nobody is killed in the movie theater. You look film about the Vietnam War. You think about things. Our project, they're not about things. The ecology of Biscayne Bay is not about things. Is the ecology in Biscayne Bay. It basically, we inherit all these uh, meanings of the site to become part of the work of art. And this is why we don't do commissions, because the, through the permitting process, the work, work, work of art creates her own identity. We do not know what the project is. When we start over the river with these little drawings, 1992, I have no slightest idea that we already spent seven million dollars and we don't have a permission. And I don't have a slightest idea that we need to have these books of 2,029 pages on many, many own books, because that is happened to be a permitting process. And this is the very, very body of our work. And of course, for many normal artists who work in studio, this is bureaucratic nightmare. But for myself, Jean-Claude, this is poetical dimension of our work. You know, is the type of new poetry and a lot of humor. You know, to have all these big, uh, important people to look in our project for the work of art for 14 days and uh, spend so much energy. Actually, all that is paid with our money. There is no one single tax dollar is spent on our project. It is all paid with our money, is requested by the federal government. And of course, this is a lot of uh, humor, irony, poetry, all kind of things that they are the really the, the dimension of the work. And of course, Important past that we should never do the same thing is again because it will be stupid, it will be like idiotical. We know how to build fence, we know how to surround island. And this is the, that expedition with something we do not know is the very essence of our work. I have a question for the yeah. room. This is a question from one of the other uh, two rooms. Is part of the idea behind your projects to frame nature or to draw attention to beauty? I think, <laughs> first, uh, uh, I start with the second, the beauty. Uh, always Jean-Claude was very adamant, um, adamant, adamant that all our projects are about beauty. It is the absolute beauty. They have no messages, they have no anything, 
They're all about beauty. I'll give a little example. Uh, when <laughs> we wrapped the rice stack, uh, the federal government in Bonn that time and the city of Berlin was very nervous. They were absolutely sure because there was the dead trades and to us, we have a bodyguards and things like that. There will be incredible type of violence when the rice stack was wrapped. There was a plain cloth policeman, thousands of them in, in the millions of visitors. There was no, not one single protest or demonstration in the Rice project. Basically, the beauty disarm and everything became trivial, banal, and ordinary in front of that huge things. And the way the beauty was most important because the beauty is something totally irrational. I always say this project exists, and Jean-Claude was much more adamant than me, exist because we like to have them. They exist because artists would like to have them, not some president of republic, not some cor corporate ex uh, executive. The project, they're totally irrational, totally useless. The world can live without valley curtain, without running fence, without surrounded island. Nobody needs this project. And of course, by creating that totally uselessness of the project, we put the work of art in totally different dimension. It's above everything. Looking at our works, Everything look, other things look so trivial and ordinary. <laughs> because you're in the moment of something totally unnecessary, but it's something totally different. And that is the essential part that is not involved with the messages of political, social, economy. Of course, they have many facets because involved that side, but they are the essential part of the beauty. I forgot the other part of the question. No, okay, no, forgot about Okay, our project, there are two distinct sides of our project, I forget. There are some project, they're rural project, uh, urban project. And there, uh, you can see, see that Gates was urban project, the Rice Tech was urban project, Miami was urban project, it's a smash and dead county with over three million people living around there, where the valley curtain, the running fence, the umbrella, and of course over the river is rural project, they're all. But the, even the rural project, they're always when the humans leave. You know, aesthetically, we're, we, when you're choosing rural site, we only always need to ha have man-made structures to the scale relation. We need to have a road, telephone pole, we need to have a, all kind of reference because in the nature, you don't have an idea how the thing is big or tall. We always deal with these elements to be, that the sites of the work can be referred to something that you know about. Yes, uh, this is uh, great to be able to ask you these questions. Um, what do you enjoy most about your work and what would you uh, never do again with these projects if you could get away with it? I never do again, I don't know. Uh, it, which part of your project do you dislike so much that no, you never I, want I, to no, do no. again? I, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I, we love every, I love every second of our project. Of course, the biggest, the most biggest enjoyment when the project is realized. And I can tell you, all our projects have a two distinct periods, the software period and the hardware period. The software period, when the project is only on my head, to the height of Jean-Claude, and the piece of paper, and the mind of thousand people who try to stop us, and nine, <laughs> thousand people who try to help us. The project do not exist. It exists only in the mind and vision of the people. And that is the software period. And it's very difficult to articulate and explaining and it's, uh, Jean -Claude, uh, always co I come to the, another comparison, Jean-Claude will explain very well, but a little later. And of course, the hardware is period when we get the permission and we're involved with the physicality of the site. Basically, 100 meters, two, two miles, three miles, the wind, the hot air, the, the water, everything is physical. They are real elements. And we, myself, Jean-Claude, we love tremendously the physicality of space. That is irreplaceable. No, no computer screen, no anybody can replace that thing. That, the fear, the, all these big things of the real things. But of course, they are linked together. We cannot have the hardware period, it will not get permission. And Jean, this is a perfect exa uh, Jean-Claude uh, example. She was saying always, it's like the nine-month pregnancy of the woman. The, the, uh, the uh, pregnancy, the woman is not pregnant to, to, to because she likes to vomit and like to, she's pregnant to like to have a baby. It's the same things. We are pregnant for that many years to have our baby and dad. 
Yeah, the pregnancy is not the aim. The, preg <laughs> the uh, 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 aim is the baby, yeah. Hi, um, I'm an undergraduate at Dartmouth, and I, I'm an art history student. I just wanted to say that we're so honored for you to be here today. Um, but Pleasure, my, not honor. Thank you. <laughs> my question is, um, who would you identify to be your, your biggest influences um, from modern art from the 20th century or from any uh, other time? First, I, uh, before that, I should tell who was most influential to do the, what I am doing art is my parents, you know, my mother. Uh, uh, find myself that I was drawing all the time. I was five, six years old, and my mother decided I should have a private lessons of drawings, painting, and sculpture, and doing scale models, architectural scale models, at the age of six. After school, I have a private lessons and going to tutor since age of six. And since age of six, I try to be an artist. You know, basically, this is the story. But also, I was uh, born, I was grown in, in the communist Bulgaria. And through this year, the very communist Bulgaria, that is the, in the late 40s, early 50s, and, and uh, 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 was very, very different type of training, you know. I was going to art school, who was the, and the uh, 19th century academic school. You go eight years to become an artist, but in that school for four years, you, you also artist, sculpture, or, or architect, go to the same school, and the first four years, First four years, you study everything. Even I have a fourth semester of medicine, cutting human bodies, uh, and doing architectural scale models, etc. And when I escaped from a uh, communist country, I was still in my fourth years. After four years, he decided to become painter, sculptor, or architect. And you see very well, I'm not yet decided what I should be. <laughs> uh, uh, and you see, all that is part of the training I have. Now, what is the biggest influence of other artists? They're classical and modern artists, but certainly you can say that I was growing in very romantic periods and uh, dur during the early, late 40, early 50, when I was in the communist Bulgaria, we have uh, professors uh, from Soviet Union coming to lecturing us, all socialist, realist artists, but when we were drunk uh, in the evening, they started to talk what art was practiced in Russia and so Soviet Union. And of course, the most biggest interest for me was the art who was really practiced in Soviet Union after 1917 to 1929, when there was a huge explosion to art outside of the bourgeois commodity. I talk like Marxist, but you know, I should understand. When art should be outside of the museum and the space, there was the civil war, there was the famine in Russia, and the movie director, theater director, architect, painter, sculptures was doing temporary, today called very fancy installation, with propaganda activity. And probably that was the most uh, in inspiring thing that the art was putting outside of the way we're seeing art. And they are great artists, movie directors, I can tell you the names from Soviet period. Another question from the other room. Why do you choose to make your art so big? <laughs> no, uh, uh, our, our project, Jean-Claude Meissner project, they're not very big. They're big only because they're works of art. The humans do much bigger things. They build highway, bridges, skyscraper, airport, much bigger. They're big only because they're basically totally irrational. And that makes them big. But they're not, the fence was not big. We have a fence in Australia, we have a much longer fences that we build our fence. The, all these projects, no, they're not big. They're, they're big because they're so immensely useless. Chris, Christo, thank you. Um, back in the late 70s, um, I seem to recall seeing a series of drawings, and correct me if I was wrong, of yours, uh, which depicted oil barrels, if I'm not mistaken, crossing the Suez Canal? Yes. Any hope? No, that was not realized even. Yeah. Okay, and the last over 45 years, we realized 20 projects, and we failed to get permission for 37 projects. Some projects we uh, have a refusal and we don't like to do it anymore. Some projects have a refusal, like the rice stack, like the pond, like the, the gates, and we still again and again. But when we have a refusal, it would, it's not anymore our heart why we should do it, you know. This is our, we do it for our pleasure first. 
Yes, sir. Yes, you, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the major uh, obstacles was getting acceptance from the community or a political... No, 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 getting permission, not acceptance. Permission, permission, okay. Acceptance is a different story, permission. Okay. So you met with communities and there was uh, a dialogue back and forth. Did you ever go back after the project and see what the impact was on those same individuals? We always go back to the site of our project, uh, uh, really. but. I'm not a writer or journalist to see what the people think about the project. Even when the project is exhibited, it's impossible for us to understand how the people see our project. We're not Japanese ourselves to learn how the Japanese see our umbrellas, or we're not Germans to know how the Germans see the Reichstag. But myself and Jean Claude, we always have a great pleasure to go back to the site. With all our projects, we often return back to the site. And even in Australia, we were several times, and in Japan, we're flying in two days. In Japan, uh, uh, and and we have a it, it, because the site is uh, is like a part of our life. It, we spend many many days uh, on this site, and I remember uh, uh, night 2007. Jean Claude and myself were in Australia, in a, a, a little bay, and uh, and <laughs> Jean Claude was telling me, "Tell we will certainly will be totally nuts to do that project because we are suddenly there on this huge cliff, 85 feet tall cliffs." You have a, this South Pacific Ocean uh, surf, and they have a sharks down there. I remember I uh, dislocate my shoulder on the rocks with the sharks, and I think I was totally conscious that we did that project, but we were much younger. That's in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, we were. Uh, uh, and the running fence just uh, uh, last September again ret returned back to the site because the. Uh, I, should, I should start. I, anyway, we will return that because Smithsonian was re re refilming our uh, site and our ranchers and survivors and their grandchildren 33 years after the running fence. This question says that Yo-Yo Ma, the musician's yes. curiosity about the Silk Road route, gave us beautiful music, which he composed. So the question is, would it not be a great project to follow the Silk Route with thousands of miles of woven silk, <laughs> since the Silk Route is part of us all? No, this is, I don't make comments. <laughs> I tell I don't make comments about other things. I only talk about our work. No, other questions. Yeah. Yeah, I had the privilege five years ago to travel to New York to see the Gates and uh, enjoyed the work. Yeah. But I was struck that it seemed very different conceptually than many of the works where you change or um, have a visual impact on nature that's seen from a distance versus the Gates being a very interactive project. You're walking around them, through them. You can actually touch the Gates as you walk through. Was there something different about the, the approach or methodology for that particular uh, project? Uh, you're right, but that starts much, uh, uh, the case starts in 1979. And I can, I can give you how the case project happened. You know, because the, each project is coming from somewhere. This is the, the, the genesis of the case project. You know, we immigrated to the United States with SS France in 1964. And I remember very early in the morning, we saw downtown Manhattan, the classical view. And coming from Europe, I never saw a tall building like that. And this is 1964. And, and uh, certainly the architecture, the buildings was very inspiring. And the first proposal to do something in New York City was the wrap skyscraper, tall building. And there was two proposals to wrap number two Broadway, number 20 Exchange Place, 1964, 66. We started to talk with the owners of this building. They think we're nuts, you know, and we never <laughs> anywhere. After that, was uh, we tried to wrap the number one Times Square, who at that time, 1966, was the headquarter of a large chemical corporation. I remember we got to the chairman of the board explaining the project, so forget it, this is not this idiotic thing, it cannot happen. In, in the late, in the, we got to Australia, in the 70s, we spent most of the time to the, on the west, you know, the running fence, the valley curtain, and from far away, Jean-Claude and myself, we start to think that, go back to New York, you know, that, we start to find it that something is more interesting than the buildings in New York City, is the people. Actually, one of the very interesting things in New York City is that it's very, especially Manhattan, is very walking place. Thousands of people walk on the sidewalks. In the mid-70s, we were contemplating to 
use the sidewalks to do some project because basically sidewalks, they're full of people walking, but we will never get permission to do anything in the sidewalks. The second best place with the sidewalk is the parks. And of course the parks have walkways and of course we can do something with this huge amount of people walking. And there are many parks in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, and other borough, but one park is totally isolated from other relation to the natural form. For example, Prospect Park in Brooklyn is diluted with private house, houses and gardens when the West Side Park in Manhattan have a Hudson River, when the Central Park is totally cut out of other natural forms, artificial, is surrounded with uh, hundreds of city blocks, rectangular city blocks of uh, high-rising buildings, and it's designed as, uh, entirely artificially. You have a stone wall, and to go to the park, you go to entrance on that stone wall, and this entrance they call gates by Mr. Olmsted and Vox. And it's basically that very controlled space to enter. And, and we take, okay, we do projects who actually uh, 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 start to um, fill the space, the most dull, invisible space between your feet and first branches of the tree, who is absolutely non-existent. You walk in this asphalt walkway. And this is how the gates come. Now, we try to find some module, what we should do. And, and uh, we don't build arches, we build gates, who is a rectangular shape. Actually, they reflect the footpath of the 100 city blocks who are there, geometrically rectangular. When the, during the winter time, the branches of the tree, they are very organic, moving in all direction, and the, all the walkway, they have this serpentine character. That contrast between geometry, organic form, was embodied in the module of the gaze. You have the gaze and the fabric panel only attached on the top, moving in all direction, and create that distance. Of course, the, we, we put that fabric panel to come just about seven feet above the grounds to make you that teasing that you can touch it with the hand. All that was designed to create the energy and that space for a few days. This is how the gates come from the buildings to the gates. I'm not tired. I can answer many questions, at least. <laughs> Another question from another room. Which I, is, yes, I am, of okay. course. Yes, yes, yes. Right. This, question, this question, which I have in my pocket, is Have you seen any buildings in the Hanover area <laughs> that you would like to round? <laughs> That's the question. Uh, or driving no, up no. here from New York? No, we, I, I never been to Hanover. Uh, first time, uh, I heard so much about Dartmouth College, but never been here. But we're very happy to be here, really, and uh, discover, even that we arrived late in the afternoon to see some of the buildings. Other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. This is amazing. Um, I'm curious as how do you finance these projects? Okay, I, my English is not very good. I try to articulate again. I work with my hands like any artist, and I use a piece of paper to draw a very small sketch, like a little sketch was over the river was eight and a half by 11 inches, it's only pencil. And that sketch is a piece of drawing and is sold to collectors and dealers. Actually here in the museum here, we have a drawings of running fans who was bought by Mr. Tom Newman, one great collector who is not anymore alive. Tom Newman uh, bought that drawings, his preparatory st study for the running fans, done before the running fans was realized. Basically through the years, I do hundreds of sketches of drawings, sketches, collages, big drawings, scale models, the biggest amount of original works for any project was done was the rice tag, because rice tag take three refusal and we work in so many period of the getting permission. I did over 650 original works about the rice tag from the four different scale models to all kind of sketches and drawings from 1971 to 1995. Now, we kept number for us because I come why this is another story. I will explain that. This is important because there's some the art, the artists there here. And, but we sell through the years these original works through collectors and dealers and museums. Now, they do not only finance the rice tag. We sell everything. We sell early work. We sell the work is not, the rice tag was not only financed by selling rice tag study, preparatory study. It's financed by any works. All the, uh, we own this work. I, Jean Claude and myself, we were lucky. Usually when you're a young artist, you have a dealer, and you're involved with the dealers, you have exclusivity, and you hook with the dealers, and over control of the dealers. 
but I never have a dealer. And over, for 40 years, we were totally independent, and that allows that we are the biggest collector of our work. We own our own huge amount of works of art. Of course, early works, they are much more valuable, very rare, and of course, they also finance the project. This is how the project, they finance. Now, important thing is to say that work of art is temporary, but we are very strictly kept a record of the work. Through the years of each project who is realized, we keep aside number of original works. And when the work is removed, we collect all the engineering drawings, all the variety of correspondence, maps, all kind of things about the project, including the components of the project I was did. Real poles, cables, hooks, anchors, many things. And each of our big projects, he have his own documentation exhibition. They're huge exhibition from 300 to 480 items with scale models, with like a huge story of the project, photography, films, all that things. We own these exhibitions. And we use this exhibition often to sensitize a new place where we like to do projects. For example, when we try to get permission for the Reistek project and the capital of Germany, that city of Bonn, there was the Ponov documentation exhibition and museum in Bonn to explain to the German uh, politicians, uh, uh, representative, member of the parliament, how one urban project was realized and to make comparison with the Reistek. When we tried to get permission for the blue umbrellas in Japan, the Surrounded Islands exhibition of Florida was traveling in Japanese museum, but the story of Surrounded Islands with all this, etc. And actually, we own this exhibition, of course, we are not very young, I'm not, not very young, we're very eager that the exhibition stays together and the places is done. And a year ago, the Smithsonian Institution, the Museum of American Art, bought the running fence exhibition. They have a 380 pieces, the story of running fence, and is open next April, and is owned by the nation of the United States. Yeah, huh? this April. Yeah, this April, open this April. Uh, open this April uh, uh, in Washington, the Smithsonian, and if you're in Washington between April and September, you can see the running fence exhibition. The story with the scale model, with the ranchers, with the materials, the cables, and hooks, and fabrics, and everything. The real thing, part, of course. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, to talk about what you thought or what you think um, the function and important of, importance of art is in education and if you have any thoughts or advice on um, young artists studying today. Uh, the first question I do not know, education? The function of art in education or specifically in uh, college education, if you could talk uh, about if that. If art should be in college, uh, you see that I start with the telling that my parents was very uh, eager to educate, start to educate art to me when I was a little boy. And of course it's very important, but it, I know it's very difficult. I cannot speculate how sh more should be educated, but I think art is very important. Not only visual art, all the arts, but it's desire of the, the young people and desire of the school, and desire of the state is something is impossible. But basically art belongs to the to yourself, and if you like to be educated, it will be educated on art. Like, instead to play baseball or other, you go to art and you find a way to be educated on art. You know, also art, I cannot even give advice because uh, art is so particular, and many great artists was not educated. I, I give example, architect, a uh, friend of us, uh, Tadao Ando, he was a boxer. He was a boxer, professional boxer, and only at the age of 40, he was autodidactic. He started to learn architecture. And today is the great architect. He's the, really, he, artist, he, a French artist, Dubuffet, was a wine seller and started to be an artist. You know, Goya also started to do art very late. You know, there are so many examples. It's impossible to say, of course, some artists did very early, but art is so unpredictable. I cannot say more. Uh, and the other question was. Ah, artist. Now, this is another question Jean-Claude always answer better, but I cannot answer that. But that was the question that yeah, Jean-Claude was saying that we cannot answer that question, but we can give you what we do. We work 17 hours a day. We never take holidays we, because art is our life, and we work all the time. Now, for young art, people who like to be artists, it's very easy. They should work 70 hours a day and do the things they like to do. But the most important thing is to know what you like to do. The most difficult part, and nobody can tell you that, to know only you know what you like to do. 
Are you inspired to do a, um, a global warming project? And if so, what is it? Global warm project. You know, really, I understand that is the big issue. I never, I, I, I love so much art. <laughs> I have, and I'm 75 soon. And I like to give all my love for art. No, I'm, I'm incredible. I love art, and I know it's terribly, but this is, I'm like that. I am artist. Mr. Christo, it's really great you're here. Uh, yeah. I have a question. So you mentioned this software hardware period. Would it ever, have you ever experienced your open, of your welcome but open arms, so you don't have the software period? And would you say you need the software period to make the uh, art really worthwhile. I don't understand the question. Yeah, you if, you, if you're ever uh, welcomed with open arms for a project, so you don't have that struggling period before you actually can make the physical appearance of the art. No, we, I, I'm not masochist. I hope you understand. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love to have the permits right away. <laughs> My dear. Oh. <laughs> this is no way. I will gladly, if can get the permission right away, it will never happen, never happen. <laughs> never happen, I never get permission right away. That is the, not at all. We, are, we try to do it as easy as possible. You know, it's so complicated, but you know. We give you permission, we have. Yeah, no. <laughs> 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 yeah. Could you tell them about Berlin permission? Because that's a very good well, The Berlin, Berlin permission, how is it really? Okay, I shouldn't tell you that. I should tell you that uh, is the is very complex, but you should understand uh, the the permitting process is not invented by us, invented by logistics and the, and the government. In, I, I don't like to take one general I'm taking the case of the Rystek project. We started the Rystek project in 1971, and the per, basically the building is owned by the nation, is owned by the nation, meaning that the deputy owns the building but they have a president or speaker of the house who technically, physically house the building. And permission can be done very easy if the president of the parliament, like a speaker of the house in the United States, gives permission and the permission will be given. Now, the case with the Rystek project that the two opposing party, the socialist and conservative party, they have a different view of that project and they created that confrontation. And the, the Prime Minister of Germany, that we call Chancellor, was very much against the project. Chancellor of that time was Mr. Helmut Kohl. Now, Mr. Helmut Kohl decided the project should not go through the normal permitting process by the Speaker of the House. The project, permission of the project should go to the debate and the parliament, <laughs> 70 minutes debate, you know, oblige his own party, majority party, to vote against the project. Now, all that created huge political uh, ball. We do not, don't ask for that, but, but that way, Cole created the project much higher level. And when the debate was open, I remember very vividly, in February 23 and nine o'clock in the morning, 220 million people around the European Union was watching the debate. And of course, the project became 100 times more important. 77 deputies of the Conservative Party refused the order of call and they vote for the project. And of course, call was defeated by us. <laughs> and of course, not that of course, the project make absolutely different dimension. And I was, of course, we were very happy. And in some way, we used the system, used, uh, system was tricked by us. And of course, that made the magnitude of the project very great. And there a lot of humor to see 70 minutes important politicians to talking about the work of art for 14 days, instead of talking about the salary, the world peace, and things like that, <laughs> is the, the irony, the, the pleasure, and of course the, the foolishness of all that to see is the, all part of the excitement of the project. And of course, this cannot be invented, cannot be by, cannot be organized. Thank you for being here as well. Um, really honored to have you here. I was going to ask you, you've been dealing with all sorts of people, people who are uh, across the world, people who know what they think they know what art should be or not be or what it represents. And I was wondering if you could speak to, because you've dealt with so many different types of people, um, the ranchers in California or administrators in 
or politicians in Germany. What uh, conversation have you had during your career with someone that really lent you to think differently or expanded your own idea of what art was? I mean, if you are dealing with a rancher, for instance, or somebody else, have you <laughs> had some very uh, interesting memorable, com memorable conversations okay. about I think art? the memorable conversation is much very nice is the example of the umbrellas, because umbrellas is a project and two parts to highlight similarity, a difference to the, between two richest countries in the world. Now, even the, before the umbrellas was realized, already we were confronted with the similarity differences. Now, we need to recruit a lot of young workers in Japan, California, Jean-Claude myself, very much like tonight, we have a lecture course site presentation of umbrellas in the University in California, in Los Angeles, and after that, we hope that some of these young people we ask questions and we will apply to work and everybody's paying our project. After lecturing in California, the, the first question was, who pay for the umbrellas? And how much we cost? And we explained that we pay for the umbrellas and every worker will be paid and the money come from the sale of region bus. We fly to Tokyo in Japan. We lecture again, the same thing, we're a great translator to university uh, Japanese students in Tokyo. And the first question from Japanese, why yellow, why blue? <laughs> I can answer more specially. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>